Hey guys, today we're going to be talking about chapter 11 from Campbell Biology and Focus. It's going to be over Mendel and the gene idea. Okay, so the genetic principles that we're going to be talking about are how um, the parents are able to pass traits onto the offspring. So there's a couple of different hypotheses that were first predicted to kind of come up with an explanation of this. The blending hypothesis is the idea that the genetic material from two parents is actually blended together. Imagine like paint. If you mix blue and yellow, it would make green. You know that you're not exactly a complete equal blend of your two parents. So, you know, this hypothesis is not correct, but this was one of the ones that was proposed to explain how parents uh, transfer their traits onto their offspring. Um, and then there's one also called the particulate hypothesis, which is the idea that parents pass on discrete um, heritable units called genes. And this is what Mendel actually did his experiments like trying to support. So Mendel documented a particulate mechanism through his experiments with garden peas. So he studied pea plants because they had distinct versions of different characteristics that he was able to control in a uh, kind of closed setting. And that's what he did in order to try to prove the particulate theory. So Mendel used a scientific approach to identify two different laws of inheritance, the law of independent assortment and the law of segregation, which we'll get to in a little bit. So Mendel discovered the basic principles of heredity by breeding garden peas and carefully planned experiments. So again, he's using pea plants. Um, so he used the quantitative approach. So he did a whole bunch of different experiments because the more you repeat something and you get the same result, then that means that it's pretty much, it becomes a trend. It's something that you start to predict. Okay, so Mendel um, chose to work with peas because peas have distinct heritable features or characters such as like the flower color. They're either purple or white. And with the seeds, you have like wrinkled or round and the peas were green or yellow. There's always two options and there wasn't anything else crazy like a third option or a blend of the two. It was just, it's either this or it's that. And that's why he chose peas. And also he was able to control the mating between the plants with animals is a little bit more difficult, but plants is pretty simple. So this is basically the technique that he did. So uh, you know that with flowers, you have male parts and female parts. So he was able to um, control the pollination by using a paintbrush to transfer pollen from the desired plant to the other desired plant to have that cross, that um, the breeding between the two plants. And then you see in step four that he was able to produce peas that way and then plant those peas to create the F1 or the first filial generation. So the P generation represents the parental or the parents. And then you have the F1 generation, which is filial. So if you have parental and parental, let's say that this is dad and this one is mom and the F1, let's say, is you. And then when you have children someday with someone that you love and marry, when you are financially stable, um, you will have the F2 generation, which will be your kids. So that's how the generations work. So the P is your parents, the F1 filial one is you, and then F2 would be your children. So Mendel chose um, to track only characters that occurred in two distinct alternate uh, forms, which is what I just talked about, either the purple or the white flowers or the round or the wrinkled peas. So it was always two forms of a characteristic. Um, he also used varieties that were, quote, true breeding, which were plants that produced offspring of the same variety when they self-pollinate. So if you have a flower that pollinates itself because it has male and female parts, then it creates more of itself. So it doesn't, you know, if you have a purple flower that's pollinating itself, it's not going to create a white flower. It creates more of the same type of plant. So a purple flowered plant would create a purple flowered offspring. A white flowered plant would create a white flowered offspring. That's what a true breeding plant is. Okay. So in a typical experiment, uh, Mendel mated two um, contrasting true breeding varieties. So the process is called hybridization. So a hybrid is a mixture, right? So he's using um, basically two true breeding. So this would be like your purple that creates only purple with a white flower that creates only white flowers to generate um, a hybrid that has the gene for purple and the gene for white. 
in order to figure out like what's going to happen with that. Okay. So that's what he's trying to look at here. What's the hybrid going to look like? Because we know a true breeding purple is going to make purple. A true breeding white is going to make white. So what happens to that hybrid? Okay. So a true breeding parent is called the P generation. And then the hybrid offspring is called the F1 generation. And I just explained filial one and filial two to you guys a second ago. Um, when the F1 individual self-pollinate or cross-pollinate, so this is with its own flower or with a different flower um, with another F1 hybrid, then the F2 generation is produced, which would be like your children. If P was your parents, F1 is you and F2 would be your kids, the next generation. Okay, so this is one of the first laws that Mendel discovered, the law of segregation. Okay, so when Mendel crossed these contrasting true breeding white and purple flower pea plants, all of the F1 were purple. They are hybrids and they were all purple. So the white flower plant up here made white flowers. This purple flowered plant made purple flowers. And then when you mix the white and the purple together, you got more purple. Okay, so that's his first finding. So when Mendel crossed the F1 hybrids, which are all of these purple ones that have a gene for quote white and a gene for quote purple, okay, uh, many of the F2 plants had purple flowers, but some had white. So this was most of them were purple and a few of them were white. So that's the F2 generation. So Mendel discovered a ratio of three to one. This is something that you will see a whole bunch of times coming up in all of these genetics questions, okay? Um, purple flowers to white flowers in the F2 generation, okay? So because the F1 generation is all hybrids, I say when you have a double hybrid cross, which just means two hybrids, a hybrid with another hybrid, which we'll talk about an example in just a minute. It's always a three to one phenotypic ratio. The phenotype is what you can see, what it looks like. Okay, so this means that if you have a double hybrid cross, so this is like F1 with F1, the phenotypic ratio is always going to be a three to one ratio. So that's what he's discovering with his law of segregation, which we'll define in a little bit. But this is what he discovered with this particular experiment, which we know to be true today. So it's really cool that he discovered this a long time ago and we still use it today. So this is basically what this looks like. So you have your P generation, the parental. So you know true breeding flowers. You know that this purple flower made more purple flowers. You know that this white flower made more white flowers. But when you mix the two of them together, it created a purple flower. Okay. So all plants had purple flowers in the F1 generation. But they are all hybrids because they're a product of both purple and white. Okay. So then when you self-pollinate or cross-pollinate the F2 generation that we're getting with a F1 by an F1 is going to give you an F2, you get a three to one phenotypic ratio. Remember, phenotype is the way that it looks, what it looks like. You can see that there are three purple flowers and you have one white flower. That's the way it looks. I'm not saying anything about any letters, alleles, genes, nothing like that. Just physically the colors, you can see that. Okay, so Mendel reasoned that the F1, that in the F1 plants, the um, heritable factor for white flowers was hidden or masked in the presence of a purple flower factor is what he's calling them, right? Factor. Okay, he called the purple flower color dominant, dominant, because it's going to dominate. If it's present, you're going to see it. So seen, it's what's seen. Okay, and the white flower has a recessive, a recess in like a wall, it's like a, like a hole, like it's, it's hidden. Okay, so this is covered or masked, except for in one instance that we'll talk about in a minute. The factor for white flowers was not diluted or destroyed because it reappeared in the F2 generation, which means that it must still be there, but because we had the dominant trait, we did not see the recessive trait. 
So Mendel observed the same pattern of inheritance in six other pea plant characters, each represented by two different traits. So he studied the flower color first, but then when he looked at the, um, the color of the peas themselves or the texture, whether it was a wrinkled pea or a round pea, again, these are the two like alternate um, characters that he was studying, he noticed the same pattern. So if you have true breeding, they're going to make the F1, which is all hybrids. And if you breed the hybrids, you're going to get a three to one phenotypic ratio. And that's what he discovered. So what Mendel called the heritable factor is now called a gene. And this is like a segment of DNA. Okay. And I'm going to introduce another word to you here, gene. Um, let's say that you have a gene for, um, height. What are your options? You'd be tall. You'd be short. These are like the varieties of the gene, right? The options. This is called an allele. You can have the allele to be short. You can have the allele to be tall. And those are a subset of categories underneath a gene. So an allele is a variety of a particular gene. If the gene is height, you can be tall or short. Those are the alleles. Okay. So here's an example of the um, F1 crosses for the seven different characteristics of pea plants that he studied. So you look at the flower color, seed color, seed shape, all of this stuff. Okay, basically what you're looking at is the ratio that he found. And again, it's a phenotypic ratio phenotypic, which means this is what it looks like. How does it look physically, pheno, physical, what it, what it looks like. Okay, so these are all arguably pretty freaking close to a three to one ratio because it is a hybrid with another hybrid because this is an F1 with an F1 generation. So your F2 generation, which is this ratio is describing is going to be a three to one phenotypic ratio. Okay, so Mendel developed the model to explain the three to one inheritance pattern he observed in the F2 generation and four related concepts make up this model. So first, um, alternative versions of genes account for variation in these inherited characters. So for example, uh, the gene for flower color and pea plants exists in two different versions. You have the purple and you have white. Okay, these alternative versions of a gene are now called the alleles. So that's what I said. If the gene is flower color, flower color, the alleles are going to be purple and white. Again, these are like the options, the varieties that you can have underneath that category of that gene. Okay, each gene resides at a specific locus. This is location on a specific chromosome. So this just means that each, each gene, each little piece of DNA exists on a certain area on a chromosome. So if these are the chromosomes that you're looking at here, you have a pair of homologous chromosomes which contain the same types of information. You can see the allele for purple flowers is located here. The allele for white flowers is located here. Okay, so that's the locus for the flower color gene exists in these locations. But your allele is going to be different just based on your particular genetics. Second, for each character, an organism inherits two alleles, one from each parent. So you get two, one's from mom, one's from dad. So this is what this is demonstrating up here for you. Let's say that you have the female part that donated the uh, purple allele and the male part donated the white allele. So you're getting one from each parent, but you have a pair of chromosomes that help determine that particular trait for you. Okay, so Mendel made this deduction without knowing about the existence of chromosomes. So he knew that they must be in the same place because they're coding for the same information. Um, two alleles at a particular locus may be identical as in a true breeding plant um, in the P generation. So you could have a purple allele and a purple allele would be the same type of allele. And they can also uh, be different. So the two alleles at a locus may differ as in the F1 hybrid. So this is what it would look like in an F1 hybrid. If this was purple instead of white, that's what it would look like in a true breeding plant because all it can give is a purple gene. Okay. So third, if the two alleles at a locus differ, then the dominant allele 
determines the organism's appearance because the dominant dominates. If it's there, you're going to see it. And the other, the recessive allele, has no noticeable effect on the appearance because it is hidden. It is masked. Okay, so in flower color example, um, the F1 plants had purple flowers because the allele for the trait is dominant. So let's do a capital P would be purple. This is your dominant trait. And your lowercase p, I'll make it super small, was the white allele. This is your recessive which means that when you got one purple allele from the purple plant and one white allele from the white plant, because this P exists, exists, it's going to dominate, dominate because it's the dominant, which means that you're going to see purple. So I hope that that makes sense. Okay, and lastly, um, now known as the law of segregation, like I said, one of the laws that he created or discovered in his studies here, the two alleles for um, a heritable character separate or segregate during gamete formation and end up in different gametes. Because we know that you end up splitting your 46 chromosomes in a human into 23 and 23, each of these genetically unique um, sex cells, hello, sex cells are um, genetically unique. So essentially you're splitting your gene into alleles and they're going to segregate or separate during gamete formation and end up in different gametes. So an egg cell or a sperm cell only gets one of the two alleles present. So those F1 hybrids that we just talked about that I told you had one gene for purple and one or one allele for purple and one allele for white. During meiosis, when you create your gametes, one of those traits is going to go into one cell and the other trait is going to go into the other cell. They're going to separate. This is the law of segregation. They separate and they segregate from each other independently. Okay, so the segregation of alleles corresponds to the distribution of homologous chromosomes um, to different gametes in meiosis. So if you have, if you are a true breeding purple, you'd have two dominant traits, which means that in meiosis, you're only going to create sex cells that have that dominant trait. If you are a white true breeding pea plant, you're only going to create little tiny, uh, well, little tiny peas here, but you're only going to create the white copy. So you can only donate the white copy and this one can only donate the purple copy of that allele. But if you are the hybrid, you can give either a purple trait or a white trait. Okay, so they separate. That's the law of segregation. That's what that means. Okay, so here's an example again of what we were just looking at. So the P generation is the parental generation. You know that they are made up of true breeding plants. So this means that you have dominant dominant making up our purple and recessive recessive making up our white. So you can get only, right? This is why it only shows one P here and one P here because this flower right there can only donate a purple big P. It doesn't have anything else. So that's why it only shows one because it's redundant to put another big P here. Okay, like you don't, you don't, oops, you don't really need to do that, okay? Um, and over here, same thing, you only can donate a small piece, so you don't have to put it twice because that's all that it has to give, okay? So we're doing the cross um, of big P, big P with little p, little p, which gives you all hybrids. So that's what's happening right here, right? You can see that all of them have the hybrid genotype, which is also called heterozygous, okay? The white one is called homozygous. Homo means same. Homozygous recessive. Why is it called homozygous recessive? Because homo, same, little p, little p, those are the same and recessive because it's a little p, it's recessed, it's hidden, it's masked. Okay, and then over here we have our purple one. It's big P, big P. So again, that is homozygous, 
homo because they're the same, big P, big P. I didn't say anything other than big P, right? And it's dominant because they are capitalized. So if you cross a homozygous dominant plant with a homozygous recessive plant, you will get all heterozygous plants. Hetero means different. And you know it's different because big P, little p, I said two different things. So different, they are different, okay? The alleles are different. So then in the F2 generation, when you cross the F1 and the F1, big P, little p, big P, little p, you end up with big P, big P as 25%. You have big P, little p, and big P, little p, big P, little p. Two out of four makes up 50%. And then lastly, you have little p, little p, which makes up 25% because that is one out of four. Okay, and these are the genotypes. Okay, but let's look at the phenotypes. Phenotype is the way that it looks. Okay, the genotype is going to be the letters. Phenotype is the way that it looks like, right? It's the physical, um, the physical aspect. Phenotype. So how many purple flowers do you count? I count one, a two, a three. Three to what? Three, two, one. Oh my gosh, it's almost like we just talked about that, which could also be called a 75 to 25% ratio. The bigger number is always going to be what is dominant. In this case, it is purple. Okay, so that's how that works. So Mendel's segregation model accounts for the three to one ratio that we just talked about. Um, he observed in the F2 generation of his numerous crosses. The possible combinations of sperm and egg can be shown using a Punnett square, which is what we just looked at. That's what this is right here. I also like to draw them without the square sometimes because I'm lazy. Okay, um, it's a diagram for predicting the results of the genetic crosses between individuals of unknown genetic makeup. So let me just highlight something here for you. This word predicting, okay? So right here, when we have that this is the predicted cross, does this mean that if you end up with four Ps, you're gonna have this exact ratio that we just said? No, it's a percent chance. You have 75% chance of an offspring being purple. You have 25% chance of that offspring being a true breeding purple or homozygous dominant plant, okay? It's a percent chance used to predict. Okay, and there are limitations to it, and I do just want to point that out. So a capital letter represents a dominant allele, which is what we were talking about. So in these examples, it is the purple allele, and a lowercase letter represents the recessive allele, which is going to be white from the example that we just went through. For example, big P is the purple flower, and little p is the white flower. Now, I hate using peas. I never use them unless you, like, exaggerate them the way that I do. You're going to mess them up every time. I like to use the letter B because it's obvious or the letter G because it's really obvious. Okay, but in the questions, if they give you the letter P, make sure that you do this and you make them very exaggerated so you don't confuse yourself on something silly. Okay, so genetic vocabulary. I gave you a little bit of a preview of this. So an organism with two identical, well, how else can we say identical? Same alleles for a character said to be homozygous because homo literally means same, okay, um, for controlling that gene character. Okay, so an organism that has two different alleles for a gene is said to be hetero because that literally means different for the gene controlling that character. And unlike homozygous, heterozygous are not true breeding. They are called hybrids because they have both characteristics. Okay, um, because of the effects of the dominant and recessive alleles an organism's traits do not always reveal its genetic composition. An organism's traits, what it looks like, does not always reveal its genetic composition. That's the actual genes. So here we're getting into the word phenotype and the word genotype. Okay, so we distinguish the phenotype, the physical phenotype, physical phenotype, what it looks like. You can walk up to somebody and say, oh, I noticed that you have blonde hair. You cannot walk up to them and determine their genotype. Oh, you look, uh, you know, big P, big P. You don't know that, right? You can tell what they look like, but you do not know what their genes are by looking at their bodies, okay? 
So in the example of the flower, the um, flower color and pea plants, big P, big P, big P, little P, they have the same phenotype. They look the same. Those are both purple flowers. Why? Because they contain a dominant trait. As long as there's one, you're done, okay? Um, but the difference is going to be the genotype, the letters. The letters are different, okay? Because big P, big P is not equal to big P, little P. They are purple, that's correct, but they are not equal to each other. The genotype is not equal to each other. Okay, so here's some more about that. Phenotype here is going to be purple, purple again, purple again, okay? You have the three to one ratio that we were talking about for the F2 generation, all right? So you have big P, big P, which is homozygous what? It is homozygous dominant words are hard sometimes. And you have the heterozygous. Hetero means different. You have a big letter and you have a little letter. They are different, but they are all the same color. That is the phenotype physical. Oh, this is purple. You cannot say, oh, this looks big P, big P. You don't know that. Okay. And then the white looks white. It is a phenotype, but it is little P, little P, two little letters. It is homozygous recessive. Okay, so notice that the ratio, phenotypic ratio, that's why I was very careful to point that out early on. That is the phenotypic ratio. And the genotypic ratio, the genotypic ratio are different. Okay, you will typically not be asked too much about this one. Not like it's difficult to figure out and then one and then two and then one. Okay, but then over here, our three to one ratio is talking about the way that it looks. You can see that you have one, two, and three purple flowers and only one little white guy. Okay, so the test cross. How can we tell the genotype of an individual with the dominant phenotype? The dominant phenotype in our case here that we're talking about is purple. If you look at this purple flower, you cannot tell this purple flower and this purple flower are different because they look the same. So how can you tell? So we're doing something called a test cross. So such an individual could either be homozygous dominant, homo means same, so that would be big P, big P, or heterozygous, which would be big P and little p. Okay, the answer is carry out a test cross to predict, right? Breeding the mystery individuals with a homozygous recessive individual. All right, so um, if the offspring display the recessive phenotype, the mystery parent must be heterozygous. So let's look at what this looks like. Okay, so you have a purple flower and that's all you know about it. You don't know if this is the genotype or this is the genotype. But what you're doing is a test cross. Okay, and you're doing it with a recessive phenotype, which is little p, little p. Okay, so if the flower has big P, big P, if it is homozygous dominant, these are going to be your results. If the flower is a hybrid, these are going to be your results. Okay, so if it is big P, big P with little P, little P, all of them will be purple. But if suddenly you have a white flower spring up out of nowhere, you know that it was a hybrid because the hybrid is the one that had the white gene to donate. You need two white genes to make a white flower. So one white gene had to come from here and one white gene had to come from here. So that's how a test cross works. The second law, law of independent assortment, Okay, uh, Mendel derived the law of segregation, which was the first one that we talked about, his first law that he's famous for, and this is the second one that he's famous for, by following a single character. So the F1 uh, offspring produce, produced in the test cross were mono hybrids. Mono means one, because you're dealing with one trait, like flower color. I didn't say oh, it's purple and it's a tall plant. You don't know that. We're just looking at one trait, okay? So that is a monohybrid, which is an individual that is, well, heterozygous for one character. So the F1 monohybrids were heterozygous for one character, big P, little p. They were heterozygous for flower color, which is a monohybrid cross because you're only dealing with one single trait. Okay, so a cross between these heterozygotes is called a monohybrid cross. Um, Mendel identifies his second law of inheritance by following two characters at the same time. We say two is die, and if we're saying hybrid, 
is a cross between two things. A dye hybrid is going to be a cross of two true breeding parents differing in two different characters, okay, that are going to make an F1 generation heterozygous for both characters. This is going to get a little bit hairy, but just bear with me. This sounds a lot more complicated than it actually is. Okay, so a dye hybrid cross this is going to be a big pun and square, but we're going to get through it. Okay, is a cross between F1 dye hybrids. So dye hybrids, two traits. Two traits. That's literally what that means. Okay. Can determine whether two characters are transmitted to offspring as a package or if they are inherited independently. So what this would mean is if you are a purple flower, does that mean that you have to be tall or can you also be short? What about if you're a white flower? Can you be short or do you have to be tall or does it matter, right? It's trying to see if you're purple, does that mean you're also tall or can you be purple and short? It's trying to see if they're a package deal, like purple and tall only go together or is it independently? Like, oh, if you're purple, you could be tall or you could be short depending, you know, just he, that's what he's trying to figure out here. So before you freak out, because now we're using four letters and we have a 16 hybrid square over here, let's just, let's work on something for just a second. I guess I'll do it down here. Okay. So we have the P generation, which is always the true breeding, right? It's always true breeding. How do you know that? Because it is homozygous for the Y and it is homozygous dominant for the R. And the same thing is true over here, homozygous for the Y, homozygous for the R. Now this is of course our dominant trait and this is our recessive trait, okay? And this is the gametes that we're going to create here. And you're saying, how do they do that? Okay, well you can't give someone YY, like big Y, big Y because you only give one of each letter. That's the law of segregation that we learned about a couple slides back. So that gamete would either have a Y or a Y. Yes, they're the same, okay? But you only get one Y. You can't give it both genes, both alleles, I'm sorry. And then for the R, we'll do the big Rs. You can only give a big R or a big R. That's ugly. Big R. You can't give anything else. And if you give both R's, you can't do that because you're determining the whole gene. You only get one because the law of uh, segregation says you only get one. So in this case, <clears throat> you're just putting the Y and the R together, the Y and the R together in the same gamete. And the same thing is happening here for our little Y, little R. Okay. So that's the only gamete that that can produce. Because if you think about it, where's the big Y in, in our green one here? There is no big Y, so it can never give a big Y. Where's the big R? Well, there isn't one. So it has to donate this to the offspring, which means that when you do that cross, all of the offspring are going to have the um, hybrid. It's a double hybrid. The F1 generation is always the hybrid. And if we're doing a dye hybrid, two traits, it's going to be hetero for both. That's not how you spell for, for both traits. Hetero, big Y, little y. I said two different things. Big R, little r. That's also a um, heterozygote trait, okay? So you have your predictions here. You know that you're um, predicting the F2, okay? So you're predicting the hypothesis of dependent assortment means that they have to go together, that you're saying if you are a yellow seed, you are also a round seed. And then if you are a green seed, you have to be a wrinkly little seed, okay? So dependent means that they go together. Independent means that they, um, they do not rely on each other. Okay, so this is one model here and this is another model here. We know that independent assortment is, is the true scenario and this has a special phenotypic ratio. It's called a 9331. Okay, so this is for a double 
um, heterocross and a dye hybrid. So if you notice that the um, the double crosses are the ones that are special. So there's a three to one phenotypic ratio for a monohybrid uh, double heterozygous cross. And in a dihybrid uh, cross, if you have a double heterozygote individual with a double heterozygote individual, you will always end up with a nine three three one ratio. Okay. So the result for Mendel's dihybrid experiments are the basis for the law of independent assortment. It states that each pair of alleles segregates independently of each other, um, of each other, uh, of each other pair of alleles during gamete formation. So this law applies to genes on different non-homologous chromosomes or those far apart on the same chromosome. The genes are located near each other on the same chromosome. They tend to be inherited together. Well, that makes sense because if you're talking about like the chromosome and you have a gene right here and you have a gene right here, chances are they're probably gonna stick together. But if you have another chromosome and you have a gene here and you have a gene here because of that thing called crossing over, there's a high likelihood that it's going to be separated somewhere in the middle. Okay. Um, the laws of probability govern uh, Mendelian inheritance. So Mendelian genetics is what we're studying right now because it's all about Mendel and his pea plants. So Mendel's laws of segregation and independent assortment reflect the rules of probability. So we're gonna talk about probability. So when tossing a coin, the outcome of one toss has no impact on the outcome of the next cross, the next toss. So you flip a coin, you get heads. Does that mean that the next one can't be heads because you just got it? No, it's just probability. You got a 50-50 shot, there's only two options. So it's either gonna be heads or it's gonna be tails. And if you flip it a hundred times, on that hundredth time, it's either gonna be heads or it's gonna be tails. Like it's not like because the 99th time was tails, oh, can't do that again, right? It's just saying that it is equally probable at all of these different times, okay? So in the same way, the alleles of one gene segregate into the gametes independently of another gene's alleles. So you got a 50-50 shot of which allele you're going to inherit. Okay, so the multiplication and addition rules apply to monohybrid crosses, monohybrid crosses. Again, that's when we have just the one trait that we're dealing with, a monohybrid cross. This is only the two letters, okay? The multiplication rule states that the probability that two or more independent events will occur together is the product of their individual probabilities, okay? So this can be applied to the F1 generation. Remember that that is going to be our... Um, heterozygous individual in a monohybrid cross. So segregation in a heterozygous plant is like flipping a coin. Heterozygous, it means that you have the big and the little letter. Okay, each gamete has a one half chance of carrying the domin dominant allele because your other option is the recessive. So it's a 50-50, dominant or recessive. And then you have a one half chance of carrying the recessive allele. So this is what it's talking about. You're doing gamete formation. You can either donate a P in your sperm cells if you're a male, or you can donate a tiny P in your sperm cells if you're a male, right? So it's either the dominant or the recessive. And it's an equal chance because you only have one of each copy of the allele. Okay, so let's look at this. Okay, so we're dealing with egg cells down here. So hi, mom, this is mom. And here's the sperm cell, so we're dealing with dad. Okay, so the segregation of alleles into an egg, you're flipping a coin. You got 50% chance of getting the big R or 50% of the little r. Same thing over here, 50% chance big R or little r, which is going to give you the, um, these two are identical. In convention, you never write the little r first, like you don't do this. The big R always goes first. So these end up being the same, right? So your 25% chance homozygous dominant, you have your 50% chance of being heterozygous, and then you have your 25% chance of being homozygous recessive. Okay, so the addition rule states that the probability that any one of two or more mutually exclusive events will um, occur is calculated by adding together their individual probabilities. Um, it can be used to figure out the probability that an F2 plant from a mono hybrid cross will be heterozygous rather than homozygous. So let's look at that. Um, I guess we're gonna look at it in just a second. I lied to you, I'm so sorry. Um, so solving complex genetics problems with the rules of probability, this is where we're gonna look at those two rules and how they apply to like the math of everything. Okay, so we can apply the rules of probability to, to predict the outcome of crosses involving multiple characters. Okay, so a dihybrid, remember that we're dealing with two, so like here's an example. 
that's one die hybrid individual because it has two traits, okay? Or other multi-character cross, you can have up to like, I mean, a billion letters, it, it doesn't matter. You know, it's just a different, um, like two traits that are happening together or three or four or five, it doesn't really matter. Okay, is equivalent to two or more independent monohybrid crosses occurring simultaneously. So two or more independent monohybrid crosses occurring simultaneously. So if this one that I wrote here was mom and then when we write another one, dad looks like this, okay? That's basically like saying we're gonna take the A's and do a cross and then we're gonna take the B's and we're gonna do a cross like that instead of doing one of those giant 16 grids where you have like a billion squares to fill in, you can try it like this as well. Okay, so in calculating the chances for various genotypes, each character is considered separately, and then the individual probabilities are multiplied. Okay, so for example, if we cross an F1 heterozygous of the genotype this, we can calculate <clears throat> the probability of different genotypes of the F2 generation. Okay, so we're doing a big Y, little y, big R, little r by a big Y, little y, big R, little r cross, because it says two of them, okay? So this is your mom and your dad. So we're gonna separate them, okay? So if you're doing a big Y, little y, big Y, little y, here's your cross, right? Like I said, I don't always like to draw the boxes, but right? That's if you took the Y's from here and the Y's from here. So now let's take the R's. Okay, you have a big R and a little r, a big R and a little r. You should notice that these look very similar. Okay, so now we're going to scroll down and see here what's up. Okay, so the probability of getting this offspring or the probability of getting this offspring. So they got this from the question. So we're calculating the different genotypes. So you have one fourth probability of big Y, big Y, because this is saying the probability that their offspring is gonna look like this guy right here. Big Y, big Y, big R, big R. Or if the offspring is dominant for all traits, um, is a homozygous dominant for all traits. Okay, what is the probability? Well, if you look at the squares, I see one out of four chances of having big Y, big Y, and having the big R, big R from down here, I see one out of four chances of having a big R, big R. So what they did is they took that one fourth percent chance and that one fourth percent chance, they multiplied it together to give you one sixteenth. So without having to solve that giant, you know, 16 squares, you can just do two of these little monohybrid crosses and then multiply them together and be like, oh yeah, it's 1 16th. Instead of counting literally only one square out of all 16, it's actually this square. I'll show you how to do that later. Um, would be this genotype that it asks you for, okay? Let's say that the question asks you to calculate this probability, okay? So that's the heterozygous for the Y, heterozygous for Y. So if we go back up here, we can see this guy is heterozygous for Y and this guy is heterozygous for Y, which gives you one half chance of being big Y, little Y. Then you also have a um, percent chance of big R, big R, which we just did right here. Big R, big R is still at one fourth. So you're gonna times one fourth chance of big R, big R. And then they do that down here. One half times one fourth is one eighth. So that's how you do those. Okay, um, for example, for the cross of this guy versus this guy, now we've added a third character. Um, we can calculate the probability of offspring showing at least two recessive traits. Okay, so we'll do the cross for P. So you have big P, little P, big P, little P. So I'm just gonna do this. Okay, for the Ys, Okay, and then for the R's. Hello? Okay. Okay, so if we are asked for this guy right here, 
Um, let's not cheat. Little P, little P. And then it wants little y, little y. Literally one here, and there's one here, and one here. Little y, little y equals two out of four. And then big R, little r. That is another big R, little r is again two out of four. So then you're gonna multiply all of those together. So you have the one fourth, we got that right. One half, we got that right. By one half, we got that right, gives you one sixteenth. Okay, and then so you could just keep going and practice these on your own because I mean, I just did them for you. So you can just go through, make sure you understand where they get all of these numbers from and just check yourself. Okay, so the chance of at least two recessive traits. Okay, because here the P's are recessive, the Y's are recessive. Here the P is, is recessive, the R. Here we have the Y and the R. Here you have the um, Y and the R with a different P. Here you have the Y and the R and the P. Okay, you have at least two being recessive. So this is going to be your overall answer. So you would have to solve each part of this and then um, add them together at the end. Okay, so inheritance patterns are often more complex than predicted by simple Mendelian genetics. So there's more going on than just like white plant, white flowers or purple flowers. Okay, so not all um, heritable characters are determined as simply as the traits in Mendelian studies, okay? This is very simplified genetics. Typically, it's much more complicated than that. However, the basic principles of segregation and independent assortment apply um, even more to complex problems um, of inheritance. So extending Mendelian genetics for a single gene. So inheritance of characters by a single gene may deviate from simple Mendelian patterns in the following situations. So when we have all alleles that are not completely dominant or recessive, so when you have a struggle for dominance, when a gene has more than two alleles, so this is when you have two more than two options, um, not just purple or white, maybe like purple, white, pink, green, whatever, you're adding an extra vari um, variation of the alleles. And when a single gene influences multiple phenotypes, and we'll get into that as well. Okay, so degrees of dominance. So in complete dominance, that's what we've been talking about. You have a dominant and you have a recessive, and the dominant always wins, and the recessive is always masked unless you have two copies, right? Um, then in incomplete dominance, incomplete dominance. I'm going to tell you that incomplete is in between. It's a, it's a blend. If you have a characteristic that shows incomplete dominance, it's a blend. If you have a red snapdragon, it's a flower. This is really common in flowers, actually. A red snapdragon and a white snapdragon. Notice I'm using two letters here, two different letters. Okay, um, you have the hybrid being red and white, which would give you pink because it is incomplete, which is in between. In between red and white is pink. Okay, the next kind of dominance is co-dominance. And I'm going to tell you co means both show. This is common in chickens. If you have a black chicken and a white chicken, black chicken and a white chicken, and they have babies, the baby is going to be black and white, like spotted, okay? So co both show, what's showing? Black and white. If it's incomplete, it's in between. Red and white in between is called pink. It's a blend, okay? So if you really take some, take some time to memorize those, that'll help you out a lot later. Okay, so here's that example I was talking about. These are called snapdragons, they're flowers. Um, in this case, they use the C to represent color, and then C to the R would be an allele for red. C to the R is the allele for red. C to the W is color white, and then C to the W is color white. So this has a red copy and a white copy, and it is in complete dominance. It'll tell you in the question, um, which is in between which is a blend. So then if you cross the F2 generation is two pink flowers together. You can tell because you have the, um, the heterozygous individuals there. Okay, 
So you have a 25% chance of having a red offspring, 25% chance of having a white offspring, and then 50% of having a pink offspring. Okay, um, the relationship between dominance and the phenotype. So the alleles are simply variations in the gene's nucleotide sequence. So when you have a dominant allele that coexists co with a recessive allele and a heterozygote, um, they do not actually interact. So they're not being like masked, they're both exerting their dominance, they both wanna be seen. So if it's an incomplete, they're both seen. And if it's in co-dominance, then you see both equally. So like a spotted organism. Does that mean that all spots come from co-dominance? No, just so you're aware. Okay, so for any character, dominant or recessive relationships for alleles depend on the level at which we examine the phenotype. Okay. So Tay-Sachs disease is a fatal and dysfunctional enzyme um, that causes the accumulation of lipids in the brain. And at the organismal level, the allele is recessive. Okay, at the biochemical level, the phenotype is incompletely dominant. Okay, so even though the organism sees it as having a recessive trait, it's still incompletely dominant, which means that both traits are shown equally, but it appears like as if it's recessive. Okay, so at the molecular level, the alleles are co-dominant. So this is just showing you a whole bunch of different um, genetic appearances here. So it looks recessive here. At the biochemistry level, it is incompletely dominant. And then at the molecular level, you see in fact that both traits are represented. They both show. So it's a varying degree of the phenotype depending on the level that you're examining. Okay, so the frequency of dominant alleles. The dominant alleles are not necessarily more common in the population than recessive alleles. Okay, I wanna point that out again. Dominant alleles are not more common than recessive alleles all the time, okay? So for example, one baby out of 400, one out of 400 in the United States is born with extra fingers or toes, a dominant trait, okay? So one out of 400 gets the dominant trait which means both of, most of us, which means that the three dots mean therefore. Therefore, most people, if they have the recessive trait, have to have two copies of it, right? Most people are double recessive or homozygous recessive for this trait. So this is called polydactyly. If you have like a little scar like near your pinky or your thumb, you might have extra had an extra finger. So ask your parents about it because that's kind of cool. It's one out of 400. I mean, like not horribly rare, but like rare enough to be kind of cool um, that you're born with an extra finger or toe. So most people are actually recessive in this case. Um, the next thing that we're going to talk about is something called multiple alleles, which is exactly what it sounds like. You have more than two variations. So most genes exist in populations with more than two allelic forms. So this is not just purple and white flowers that we've been talking about. Now we're adding an extra variety. For example, the four phenotypes of the ABO blood group in humans are determined by three alleles for the A blood type, the B blood type, and the I blood type. Does it tell you the, okay, yeah. Um, the enzyme I, uh, stands for specific, it's like immunoglobulin, a specific carbohydrate um, on the surface of blood cells. Okay, so we just use a capital I and then lowercase i really means O, but if you write O, it could also look like a zero, like percent or something. So you never use O, you always use the I, okay? The enzyme encoded by I to the A adds the A carbohydrates to the enzyme. And if it's the I to the B, it adds the B carbohydrate. And if it is the I, then it adds nothing. No carb is added. So let's look at that. So there are three alleles for the ABO um, blood groups and their carbohydrates. So for allele A, you're adding A. For B, you're adding B. And for I, you're adding nothing. Okay, so then we have our genotypes here. So if you're homozygous dominant for, or homozygous for A, you can't be dominant or recessive in this. So if you are homozygous because these are the same, you're going to ex um, express the A antigen on the outside here. If you are heterozygous for A, this means that you're adding the A up here and the I tells you that you're adding nothing. So you're just adding the A. For B, this one you're adding, this says add B carbohydrate, add G B carbohydrate, cool, got it. This one says add B, this one says add nothing, you still only have B, you're good. This one says add A carb, add B carb, A carb and B carb, you're good. Over here, this says, hey, add nothing. Well, there's nothing here, so that still checks out. So that's how we get our different blood types of A, B, A, B, and O.
okay? So this one only has the A antigen, this one only has the B antigen, this one has both of them, A, B has both, and O has nothing. O, like zero carbs on the outside. Okay, so we also have something called pleiotropy. So most um, genes have multiple phenotypic effects, a property called pleiotropy. So for exam example, pleiotropic alleles are responsible for the multiple symptoms of certain hereditary diseases, such as cystic fibrosis and sickle cell anemia, which are like really bad diseases to have. Okay. So extending the Mendelian genetics for two or more genes. So some traits can be determined by two or more genes. So not just, you know, the two that we're talking about. This is a more complicated um, genetic issue. So um, the first example here is going to be epistasis. So epistasis is a little bit confusing, but in epistasis, you have a gene at one locus, one location that alters or somehow affects the phenotypic expression of a gene at another place. So because this gene is present or absent, it's going to affect this gene over here, even though it's not in the same gene. It's not like the gene for you know, flower color. It's a different kind of gene that says like, oh yeah, you can express that. Or mm, no, you know what? You're not going to express that color. You're going to do something else. So this one locus, this one location is going to affect how the other one is represented phenotypically. So this is really common in labs, you know, like Labrador retrievers, how there's like the black ones, you got like the cream, like golden looking ones, and then you have like the chocolate labs. Okay. So we're going to talk about that. So for example, in Labrador retrievers and many other mammals, the coat color depends on two different genes. So this is how we are going to get epistasis because it's two different genes, not, which is not equal to two alleles. Okay, it's two different genes altogether. So one gene determines the pigment color, which is going to be black or brown. The other gene that's not talking about the color black or brown, okay, with the allele C for color and C for no color determines whether the pigment will be deposited in the hair. So I like to think about this as like the hair gene. So it's like, oh, okay, is it going to be black or brown? And then this one's like, eh, but is it going to reach the hair or is it just going to stay in the skin? Okay, so here's what this looks like. Okay, so you have the two genes, B and E, and B and E. Okay, so you have these two black dogs and you're like, oh, okay, so we end up with these chocolate labs, but then because that's our recessive, but we also end up with these guys here, the golden retrievers, which means that they do not have, or they have that um, lowercase c for no color that's actually represented. It's um, epistasis, which is that it's affecting the ability for that pigment to actually affect the hair color in these labs. So you end up with like a third, this is special because you end up with like that third option. Like you're expecting this and this because in the question, it would tell you capital B for black and lowercase b for brown. Okay, so you know that this is going to be our dominant and this is going to be our recessive, but then where did this guy come from? And that's epistasis because you have that lowercase c on another gene, on another gene that said, oh, you know what, that pigment, yeah, it's not going to reach that hair color. So we're just going to leave him as a little golden guy. Okay, next we're going to have polygenic inheritance. So this is when we're going to deal with uh, qualitative characters um, are those that vary in the population along a continuum. So it's kind of like a spectrum, like a range. And then you have um, these variations that usually indicate polygenic inheritance or an additive effect of two or more genes on a single phenotype. So skin color in humans is an example of a polygenic inheritance. So skin color is not just like, oh, big B, little B, it's in black or white. Like there's a whole spectrum. You know that you can be like white and be like pink, or you can be white and be slightly yellow, or like white and like your skin's so white that you're like a little bit blue. You can be like really, really, really dark skinned. You can be kind of, you know, light skin, but dark skin. There's a whole spectrum of different skin colors that exist. So this is what this is talking about. It's a polygenic inheritance where you have a continuum, a large scale of all these different varieties that are usually affected by two or more genes for a single phenotype of your skin color. Okay. So this, we're not going to get into like the actual examples of all of this, but I mean, this is just showing you kind of like, you know, you have three different genes here that are um, coming together with three different genes, mom and dad, in order to kind of give you a prediction of this is a short representation of the possibilities for your skin color, because it is a, um, like a gradient 
it's a um, it's a spectrum and it's quite large and it's increasing all the time with different you know like biracial babies or triracial babies that are being born all the time now Okay, so we have nature and nurture we're going to talk about, so the environmental impact on the phenotype. Um, so another departure from the Mendelian genetics that we've been talking about, classic white versus purple, um, arises when the phenotype for a character depends on the environment as well as the genotype. So like a product of your environment versus your actual genes. So the norm of reaction is that the um, phenotypic range of a genotype is influenced by the environment. Okay, so the phenotypic range is generally broadest for polygenic characteristics, many genes. So lots of genes, okay? So that makes sense that it would be broad. The phenotypic range, what you're gonna look like is very broad when you have many genes being involved, that makes sense. Such characters are called multifactorial uh, because the genes and the environmental factors collectively influence what you look like. Um, so integrating the Mendelian view with heredity and variation. So an organism's phenotype includes its physical appearance, internal anatomy, physiology, and the behavior, actually. Um, this is more common in, like, lesser animals than, like, humans. Okay, so an organism's phenotype reflects its overall genotype and unique environmental history. So you can kind of, like, see how the um, environment history, like, if they move from place to place, how that affects them as individuals. Okay, so many human traits follow Mendelian patterns of um, inheritance, but we did just talk about ones that didn't. And that's a lot of our traits don't, but some of our traits do uh, follow the Mendelian patterns of inheritance. So humans are not really good subjects for genetic research because the generation time is too long because you have to, you know, first of all, become pregnant, cook that baby for 40 weeks, which is really 10 months. So like, why do people say you're pregnant for nine months? That bothers me. Anyway, then you have to have that baby. Then that baby can't have babies until it's of sexual maturity age, which, you know, can range anywhere from like 11 to like, you know, like 18 or something. Like that's a long time to wait. Where pea plants, it's like a couple of weeks. Okay. So like, that's why we do it with like plants and not people because a generation time is forever. Okay. And also uh, parents produce relatively few offspring as humans because it takes a large toll on your body to have a child. Whereas a pea plant just makes peas all the time. Okay, and then breeding experiments are unacceptable. Uh, that makes sense because you don't just wanna be like, hey, you and you, you're gonna get together and have a baby and we're gonna see what happens. Uh, you know, like that's not ethical or moral. <laughs> and then to do genetic testing on that child is also, you know, wrong. Um, so we don't use humans for a lot of reasons. Um, however, the basic Mendelian genetics endure um, as the foundation for human genetics. So like a lot of what Mendel discovered in plants is extremely applicable to um, how we study and how we know our genes as humans to function. Um, we're lastly going to look at pedigrees here. So pedigrees are like family trees. Um, if you have like a fancy dog, like I have fancy dogs, you hear them barking in most of my videos. Um, today you just hear the vacuum cleaner because I'm at work, so that's fun. Um, so the pedigrees trace characteristics through like ancestry, okay? So I got pedigrees with my dogs to be like, oh, this was what their mommy dog was and their daddy dog and their grandmother dog and their grandfather dog to show that like they don't have knee problems because that's common in the dogs that I have. So like they're giving me like the genetics of my dogs to ensure that they're not gonna have any problems. So you can use a pedigree to trace back and see like, oh, hey, this trait in my family, like who has it? So this is a little family tree to show those relationships. So pedigrees can be useful to make predictions about future offspring by studying what's happened in the past. And we can use the multiplication and addition rules to predict the probability of specific phenotypes like we were doing with the uh, uh, Punnett squares all along. So this is how you read them. A male is represented by a square and a female is represented by a circle. An affected male, so a male that has the trait, is going to be colored in. An affected female is also going to be colored in. If you have a horizontal line, that means a mating. And if you have vertical lines, then that means offspring. Okay, so let's start and just look at one of these. Okay, these are two different things here. So the first generation, grandparents. So this one is grandpa. This one is grandma. Okay, and then you they had a son that has, or I'm sorry, <laughs> they had a daughter that is also affected just like her dad. Okay. Then they have an unaffected son, an unaffected son, and an affected son because he has the trait as well. He married somebody that has the trait as well. Her sister did not have the trait. Then their children, one of them got the trait, one of them did not. 
Okay, so that's how you read one of these. So over here, if we're talking about earlobes, um, grandpa here had these um, attached earlobes and his granddaughter did, but she didn't have any kids because she didn't, she didn't have any kids, right? So we can't track that through her family. But his, um, his other daughter did not get the attached earlobes. She married someone that did not have attached earlobes. And suddenly you have the appearance of attached earlobes, which means that if neither one of the parents had the trait, you know that this has to be a recessive trait. So that's how you can, oh, I didn't even realize it asked you that at the bottom. So it's a recessive trait because if you have an instance where both parents are not affected, but they have a child that's affected, it has to be recessive because that means that it's been hidden until you put them together. Okay, on the other side, the widow's peak side is just talking about that little like V in your forehead. Okay, um, so like if you naturally have that, then it means you have a widow's peak. So it's asking you if it is dominant or recessive. Okay, so in every case, you see that you have the parent has it, the kid has it, the kid has it. The parent has it here, the kid has it here. Both parents have it, and their kid has it. If both the parent and the kid, even if it's just one parent and one kid, if they both have it, it's typically going to be a dominant trait, and that's the case here. Okay, recessively inherited disorders. So many genetic disorders are inherited in a recessive manner. These range from relatively mild to very life-threatening. So recessive traits are scary, right? Because if you have big R, little r, big R, little r, well, both mom and dad are totally fine. They're big chillin'. But their kid is going to have a 25% chance of being little r, little r, which means that they could have a life-threatening disorder that neither one of the parents even knew about. So that's why recessively inherited disorders are kind of scary. So the behavior of recessive alleles. So recessively inherited disorders show up only in individuals homozygous for the allele, which means that they're going to have recessive recessive. So the carriers are heterozygous because they would be like this. So they carry that trait that they can then give to their kid, but they don't know that they have it. They're not affected by it, whatever this disease is. Um, so they carry the recessive allele, but are not phenotypic, or, but are phenotypically normal. So like totally healthy, but they can give their kid this trait that could make them have this genetic disorder. So most people who have recessive disorders are born to parents who are carriers. Okay, so that's like I said, if you big R, big R with a big R, little r, or big R, little r, big R, little r, you have 25% chance of having little r, little r, which is going to be that recessive disorder. Okay, so both parents in this case are um, carriers. And that's how that works. Okay, so here's, here's how this works. This is for um, albinism. Okay, so being an albino. So you have parents that are heterozygous, which means that they show the dominant trait, which is normal. So you get a normal trait and, a nor and an abnormal trait. You get a normal trait. You get an abnormal trait. Normal kid, normal kid who's a carrier, normal kid who's a carrier, and then the albino child. So that's how that works. Neither one of the parents knew that they had that trait for albinism, but then when they have an albino child, that's what explains it. So if recessive allele... Um, if a recessive allele that causes a disease is rare, then the chance of two carriers meeting and mating is really low. Like, especially if it's a disease that's like harmful to you and like affects your health and could potentially like cause you to live a shorter life. Those are gonna be really, really rarely passed on, okay? Um, so the closeness between our relatives here, matings increase the chance of mating between two carriers for the same rare allele because they're they're getting the same traits. So if they're, if like, you know, you, that's why like you can't have kids with like your brother because you're going to increase the chance of having these weird, rare, um, recessive alleles because you're getting it from the same gene pool. Okay. It's a very small gene pool if you're just mating within your family, which is why, uh, you know, you don't do that. Um, breeding dogs, like a lot of people who are like the breeders that breed dogs and breed brothers and sisters together from the same litter, they experience this. Like I said, my dogs are prone to having like knee problems. So I made sure that they gave me the pedigree to show that they don't have any knee problems. But dog breeders who like don't do all of that because it takes time and money um, and they just like breed to, you know, from the same litter together, male and female, if they both are recessive carriers for genetic abnormalities, a lot of times that's how you get like these mutts that have like these kind of crazy, um, 
diseases or like their legs are the wrong size or their heads are too big for their body and stuff like that because they're getting these like double uh, recessive traits that are not advantageous. Um, so most societies and cultures have uh, laws or taboos against marriages between close relatives and this is only one of those reasons also like um, ew. You don't want to have a baby with your brother. It's just disgusting. Okay. Um, cystic fibrosis is another disease. So cystic fibrosis is the most lethal genetic disease in the United States, striking one out of every 2,500 people of European descent. The cystic fibrosis allele results in defective or absent chloride transport channels in plasma membranes, leading to the buildup of chloride ions outside the cell. So what does that mean? It means that your lungs kind of fill up with this mucus and it becomes very difficult to breathe and it affects your entire life. Um, so symptoms include mucus buildup in some internal organs and abnormal absorption of nutrients in the small intestine. So typically people with cystic fibrosis are very, very skinny. They're malnourished because their intestines do not absorb nutrients correctly. They have usually really um, bad productive coughs, which means that they're constantly coughing up mucus um, and it can affect their breathing. Um, sickle cell disease is another one. It's a genetic disorder with evolutionary implications. So sickle cell disease affects one um, out of 400 African Americans, and this disease is caused by the substitution of a single amino acid in the hemoglobin protein in the red blood cells, which actually causes your red blood cells to become like kind of like sickled in shape, which means that they cannot hang on to as much oxygen to carry around your body, and that's literally their job. So in homozygous individuals, all hemoglobin is abnormal or sickle-celled, which is like this, which means that they're not efficient at carrying around oxygen. They typically will need like a blood transfusion or something in order to help them um, keep their oxygen levels up. And then um, the symptoms include physical weakness, pain, organ damage, and even paralysis. The heterozygotes are said to have um, the sickle cell trait. So heterozygous, remember, you're like this, okay? It means that you carry that trait, but you're not affected by it. Um, they're usually healthy, but may suffer a couple of the symptoms, usually not nearly as bad. Okay, about one out of uh, 10 African Americans has sickle cell trait. Um, it's usually an unusually high fre uh, frequency because of the um, heterozygote advantage that I'm going to talk about right here. Okay, so um, heterozygotes are less susceptible to malaria. So malaria is a parasite that affects your red blood cells. Okay, so there's an advantage to being heterozygous because you have at least some normal functioning red blood cells because you have the dominant trait and then you have that recessive trait, which is the sickle cell trait, which means that some of your cells are going to be sickle celled, but that means that you are um, less likely um, to get malaria or even um, in some cases you can be like um, resistant to malaria. So if you're in places where like malaria is very prevalent because there's a lot of mosquitoes and there's not like any um, prevention methods or like insecticides or anything like that, then if you are a heterozygote um, individual, then you have an advantage. It's called the heterozygote advantage, um, which means that you're not going to get malaria and you're not, you don't have the symptoms of sickle cell. So you're not going to die because you have like no access to blood transfusions to help you get oxygen in your body. You're not going to die from malaria. You're chilling in the middle. You got a little bit of sickle cell, maybe a couple of symptoms, but it's not going to kill you. And the malaria will also not kill you. So like that's the heterozygote advantage in that case. Um, nextly, we have the dominantly inherited disorders. So some human disorders are caused by dominant alleles. Uh, dominant alleles that cause lethal diseases uh, are very rare and arise by mutation. Um, so we're going to talk about dwarfism as one of the ones here. So if you have a parent that is a dwarf, it's a dominant allele and a normal uh, parent that has, you know, the recessive, which means no dwarfism because now we're dealing with only dominant traits. Okay. Um, that means that you have a 50% chance here of having a child that has dwarfism because it is a dominant trait. You'll see it a lot more than if it was a recessive trait. Um, the timing of <clears throat> of onset of the disease significantly affects its inheritance. For instance, Huntington's disease is a degenerative disease of the nervous system. And typically you start to see symptoms between 35 and 45 years of age, which is after you've had kids typically. Like in today's society, that's kind of changing a little bit, but like a lot of people have already had kids by that time and they don't know that they have Huntington's disease, but they've already passed it on to their kids. So once the deterioration of the nervous system begins, the condition is irreversible and fatal. Um, so many diseases such as heart disease, diabetes, alcoholism, mental illnesses, um, cancer have genetic and environmental concepts. 
And then the lifestyle has a tremendous effect on the phenotype for the cardiovascular health and other multifactorial characters. I mean, obviously, like, um, you know, like cancer, you know that some can be caused by going out in the sun and not wearing any sun protection. Some can be caused by smoking. These are not things that you're going to like inherit because your parents smoked a lot. But like if you smoke a lot, even if you have the best genes in the world, you're still going to end up with this disease. Um, genetic counseling based on Mendelian genetics. So today you can actually get genetic counselors to provide information to pros um, prospective parents concerned about a family history for a specific disease. They can help you gather information and determine like creating a pedigree, like, you know, are we going to pass this on to our kid? Can we get tested to determine if we have these recessive alleles? That way we know if our kids are going to be at risk for developing these awful diseases. So you can get tested now and kind of like determine probabilities, even if it's a very, very, very low probability of having something or a higher probability of having something. And then um, genetic engineering and everything has come a long way too to help remove some of those disadvantageous uh, characteristics from our genomes altogether. So each child represents an independent event in the sense that its genotype is unaffected by the genotypes of older siblings. So just because two parents have like a normal kid doesn't mean that their next kid's going to be normal if they're carriers for a particular trait, right? Like you're not like, whew, one kid done normal, our second one's going to be normal too. That's not necessarily true, especially in the case of having like those, um, the more rare conditions, the um, recessive disorders. So this was just a recap of some of the things that we talked about, the complete dominance, incomplete dominance, codominance, multiple alleles, pleiotropy, epistasis, which is where the, the dogs for that extra um, gene that influences the color, and polygenic inheritance. And then this was our example of what a um, pedigree looks like, and that's what I was just talking about right there at the end. I am going to post another video to show you a little bit more about like our monohybrid crosses where you just have the four. I'll actually like do a couple of the problems for you and then show you how to do the genotypes and the phenotypes. And then I'll actually show you how to solve out the entire big squares just in the event that your test requires you to do that. Okay, so you know how to get the um, like the the offspring from across like like this right? Because each one of these is going to have all of these, um, these four traits in here, or these two traits, but four letters represented. So I will show you how to solve these in my next video. I know that this was kind of long, but thanks for sticking with me. I hope that you found this helpful.